my name is Dante Luna. I'm a creative from Boston. I photographed 48 of 50 states. I've documented culture, art, history, nature, pop culture, uh, all over the country. Right now, we're in Providence, Rhode Island. It's, we're at the biggest show in the smallest state. It's a really small state, you know, and it doesn't reflect uh, the ambitions of the people who put this show together. Rhode Island Comic Con is a place where I get to exercise ideas and meet creative people. I love interviewing artists and craftsmen. And one of the things I love to do here is just ask questions. I like learning from other artists and other people who have dedicated their life to their art. You know, that's what I do with most of my time here. So the convention is usually a three-day weekend, and for most of the time, I'm asking questions and. Um, trying to get the most of those situations. Well, Rhode Island Comic Con, I believe, has believed in me just as much as I believe in this show. Um, I think that's the reason why I come back and why I continue to work with them. You know, um, you know, they give me the chance to do what I do. I've come here five years in a row now, and I'm, I'm growing exponentially. I multiply every time I walk through the doors. What's your mom would think about you being all hooked up like that? Well, my mom <laughs> said, uh, go to college, get a bachelor's degree, and you yeah. can get tattoos. <laughs> I, I finished my bachelor's degree at 20 years old. I gave her my diploma, my degree, and I never seen it again. <laughs> I mean, as a human being, you know, for me, it's a journey. I tell people confidence is not something you can acquire overnight. I think it's something you build and something you work on. Once I grasped my head around that, I knew confidence was something that I always need to work on. When I was young, I had to deal with the uh, uh, the speech and hearing is, uh, issue. So I had to overcome adversity. So basically, every day, what it comes down to, I just love competing with myself. Maximizing what I can do. And take it one day at a time, because if you do that, you're rich, because everything else is secondary. Be nice, be nice to yourself, be nice to other people. Don't be mean, don't be an asshole. <laughs> You have a really strong relationship with the people, you know. Have you always been that way? Like, I mean, like, at least you, I respect people like you because in a position of power, you, you, you continue to talk to the people. Well, to me, it's important because uh, nobody's better than anybody. I don't care what kind of a uh, culture you come from, the race. It's just all about being respected, respecting because uh, most people sometimes they become egocentric with money and power. They feel like they're superior, which I disagree with that because I feel like we're here for a short time. And it's all about being nice and judging people for who they are, then uh, of not what, what, what you hear about the person. I enjoy doing comic conventions because as a child, I didn't have anything like this to attend. And I would give anything to shake a celebrity hand because I was like a real life Walter Mitty. So basically, this kind of convention, I feel like the fan get a chance to meet me for the first time. They have a smile on their face, they take pictures, they ask questions, and that connection, because it's very powerful, because people walk away with that positive effect. And that really makes, affects your whole life. To me, that's why it's important, not here just making money, it's all about that connection, knowing that I can put a smile on people's faces, especially children, because the legacy of the Hulk now 40 years, and I'm still very proud of it. My incredible Hulk. Oh my God. I have a good relationship with the Hulk. My Hulk was uh, something my uncle drew a lot before he passed away and it was our my connection with him he used to always draw me the hulk uh wow and that's he passed away one. yeah so that's my that's my hulk how you how you reflecting on um being a part of a uh, storytelling have, having that be a part of your life you know it's kind of like you know the whole point of being in the film industry is like it's storytelling and you are bringing characters to life and you realize well Maybe in person I'm not the best at telling stories around a table, but hopefully I can do this through the medium of film or television or whatever, you know. Um, but I don't know, you hopefully you move people and you make them feel. You, you, normally from our point of view, it's like, oh, we have a story that we want to get out and we want to tell. I'll just be over here. Oh my goodness. Wow. 
There you go. Well, the uh, the advice that I give uh, to everyone uh, that has a dream is similar to you know what Walt Disney said: if you can dream it, you can do it. And a lot of people, you know, they they don't really understand what that concept means. And that concept means two things: one, if you want to do something, just start doing it. Yeah, maybe you're not going to get paid for it, but whatever that is, whatever you're passionate about, just start doing it right then and there. And the other part of the advice is never give up. So, you want to act? I mean, you know, people have phones. Start acting on your friends on your friends' cameras. You know what I mean? On their camera phones. Uh, get together with other people that have similar interests. You want to draw? Start drawing. Just because you have a dream doesn't mean you have to like go out there and get the job doing it. You need to gain experience first. So then you'll find out whether or not you really actually love doing that. Because if you love doing it when you're not getting paid to do it, then you'll love it forever. My name is Brandon the Shapeshifter. I go to different cons all around, like in Boston, New England area. I go to Dragon Con every single year. I do multiple costumes because it's so fun. I'm known for doing um, Maleficent, um, Zeus, Poseidon, and now Dazzler. <laughs> so let's dance, the last dance tonight. Yeah. Oh, Raymond Ramis, cosplayer, artist. Uh, I like to go to the conventions. I like to dress up in my superhero stuff. I like to make superhero stuff. I've been doing this since what, my first costume in back in 2007. And I went to my first show, which was basically people who put this one on their first show. I've been going to every one of their shows since. And, you know, just represent the cosplay community the best I can. I like to share a lot of my work on Facebook, you know, so people can see what I'm doing. If they're doing anything similar, you know, maybe I give them some ideas, help them out. I was talking to the promoter and I said, yo, uh, I, was, I have an idea about maybe doing a, a panel or a workshop, more of a workshop than a panel, um, about building cosplay. You know, just 101 stuff, nothing too major, major, but just enough to give people an understanding of uh, what it takes, what, what they'll need, you know, uh, the procedures that they're going to need to do, resources, uh, tools whatever you uh, you might need to get started. Does anybody ever use contact cement in here? Yeah, if you, if you, if you have, you, you know it, it works really well. And it basically, um, you have to adhere, put it on both sides of whatever it is that you're gonna, you wanna, you wanna you know, bond together. Let it dry for about like five minutes. It'll actually, that's the first adhesive I ever knew that applied while it was dry or drying. You wanna get a slight tack to it. I am Carly Wynn. I do a lot of sewing, so that's a lot of my cosplay work, sewing. Um, recently got into some warbless stuff, but uh, I've actually found that other plastics work as well for some things like armor. This is actually used to be cat litter totes, like for the cat litter. And you clean it up and you can just, it's plastic. Plastic, you can melt it, you can change its shape, you can form it into things. You gotta kind of have to keep going with things, like take scraps of stuff and make it into other things. Well, I've been into comic books forever, since I was a kid. I'd watch uh, X-Men on TV, I got started reading comic books, started reading uh, Sonic, I was really into Sonic the Hedgehog comics, Archie comics. Um, and then actually I went to Japan, I got into Lolita culture, and that's where I learned all the sewing because they have a lot of um, how-tos on how to sew all these dresses. And then I started going to cons, and it was like, oh, I would like that costume. Well, I can sew. I would like to dress up as Harley Quinn. I would like to dress up as magic. I would like to help other people dress up as things, too. So uh, we kind of trade off on skills. I got going a lot of props and stuff. I'm able to just throw a leg together like this. Is actually, uh, Raymond's doing a demo on this right now. It's really just EVA foam, which you see in like exercise rooms. Take a hot knife to it, take some heat to it, you can shape it whatever you want. And then she can do all the sewing work and all the stitch work. So together, we can throw together pretty good costumes. Uh, I can do the work on like hard, solid props. She can work on any clothing or cloth we together. And some things are trickier than you think. Like sewing this stuff uh, is the vinyl. It's like for a couch. And most yeah. people don't know how to sew the uh, leathers and the leathers through a sewing machine. It gets very It's going to break your needles, break your machine. Yeah. 
this was a sword that was in Kmart, but Magic has this like really silvery stuff, so we spray painted a sword, and it looks perfect, you know? It's demony, it's... Like, we didn't need to do much with it. So sometimes you can find like little things to sort of augment that you can just buy really easily. You don't have to make from scratch. These are my cooking gloves for, you know, cast iron yeah. when cooking the woods. I just kept those on. Mm -hmm. Another real important thing you want to keep on you when you're doing cosplay. Sure, it looks like an apple leather pouch, but right here, bottle of water. Always have water on you. You're going to dehydrate real fast. <laughs> He's going to dress up like uh, Doctor Strange and we're going to have <laughs> Doctor Strange and Magic. <laughs> Before the sun sets on her 16th birthday, she shall prick her finger in the middle, this middle of a spinning wheel, and die! <laughs> uh. He's like talking you up. I'm like, is this her? <laughs> like, she's amazing. Hi. Hi. Oh. I love New Mutants. Like, you don't even know. I, I love that impression. <laughs> it's my favorite. And uh, I brought some comics to get signed. Oh, so you're Forge. Also, yes. You're Forge. Ah uh, yes, Eliana. She's just a girl whose intentions are good. <laughs> but she's misunderstood. It's really inspiring to be here at this Comic Con convention. I think there's so many talented young people with such brilliant ideas and I just I love I love being around that energy and being inspired by it. And you know, to me the key thing about being creative is just doing it and not thinking, just doing and and just being fearless, and it's nice to be around that. So I've always been, um, I had my hands in a, different things. I think that creativity and art sort of comes in waves, and sometimes I feel like doing music, and sometimes I feel like writing or painting, or lately it's been directing and filmmaking, and then acting has always been my bread and butter, and it's just nice to be creative and have different avenues and different aspects to, to dive into. So I, for me, that's what art and creativity is. It's, I gotta change it up constantly. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Kimberly? Uh, Kimberly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I just wanted to ask a question. I was just wondering, of all the Black Rangers you ever worked with, which one was the sis? <laughs> You didn't see this coming in? Oh yeah. This is on, it goes like all the way up the block and around another all corner. All the way up to Atwell's Avenue like by the, to the highway off ramp and, yeah. then, and then it doubled back around again. And yeah. Like, it's under the underpass. Like it's crazy. Oh, see this? This looks see like this the Power Ranger barely the shown this audition face. when we were <laughs> Right? Seriously? Exactly. What's up? This was exactly. The Power hey, hey man. Yeah. Like when, we went, when I showed up, it was like this. And I was yeah, like, no, we're on the way there. We're in the car on the way there. Okay. All of us. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Come on in. Oh, I'm, I'm the missing ranger. I'll be I'll be You complete the team. Yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah, let's go. There we go. Perfect. Prison pose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got a smile. I was like, ah! I'm like, <laughs> On the anchor, look at that. Awesome. Yeah. This is very cool. It's beautiful. Yeah, my favorite suit, my favorite superheroes. Um, I was a big wrestling fan, so you know, I followed all of that. In fact, I would come here and watch a lot of the rest wrestling matches. I'd follow it all at WWF, then a little bit into WWE. Uh, but superheroes that I liked, I always liked. Uh, I always liked Batman, and I always liked Spider Man. Spider Man always seemed to be just an average guy. He was out to. Um, you know he um, he had you know certain superpowers, but not uh, but not fully. He um, you know he um, everyone loves the webs as well. Mm -hmm. So you know th those are the those are the two that I follow the most. A little bit of Superman as well, uh, but I'd say Batman and Spider Man the most. My question to you is uh, you know you perceived as a hero for me especially. Like how how you um how do you handle that? How do you handle being perceived as as a hero to people? 
Well, that's that's a tough question, but I think um, you know you you always try to live up to what you would expect yourself. You know, like you have your own heroes growing up, and someday if you're fortunate enough to find yourself in the same like in that heroic kind of um, role or a heroic character, whether you're a policeman or a phys ed teacher or whatever it is. Um, you have to look at it from the same way you did as a kid. You know, you never want to dis- disrespect yourself kind of thing. You, you, that's how I always judge everything. It's like, would I, you know, like, how would I, how would I, um, like, when I meet somebody or how would I would have wanted to meet me, someone like me when I was a kid. And, you know, I've met a lot of, um, like rock and roll guys and people that were my heroes before I saw them. Then after I saw them, they weren't my heroes anymore. And, uh, you know, sometimes the worst thing to do is to finally actually meet your hero and you find out that they're not such nice guys after all. But I've always had a different approach is that I try to present myself in a way where when somebody sees me or they um, finally meet me, that I would treat them the way they the way they want me to, the way they imagine it, like before it ever happens. And, uh, you know, like signing autographs for fans or um, walking to your car after a show. You know, it's easy to tell some kids to, to f*** off and you're too tired and you're going to go to bed. Or, you know, but I always remember being one of those kids. A big Back to the Future fan. Biff is one of my favorite villains of all As time. well he should be. <laughs> <laughs> my question's uh, for Christopher. Christopher, um, believe it or not, as much as I love Doc Brown, like you were one, of, you played two bad guys. My favorite bad guys of all time, which is the the bad guy and uh, Roger Rabbit, um, and uh, <laughs> Judge, Judge Jones. and then my, one of my favorite bad guys was psychologically imprinted in my head as a kid. Uh, the bad guy, Dennis the Menace. Yeah, so that, that role, that role is stuck in my head. That image, and as many different times as I've seen you, that image is stuck in my head. So I want to get your thoughts and your feelings on those two roles. Oh, uh, what was the first one? The first one was Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit, Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Well, there was a uh, comic strip of the two crows, and they, they are like uh, detectives, and they keep spoiling each other and getting... Screwed up. Uh, uh, Mad Magazine, Spy versus Spy? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Two crows. <laughs> Two crows. And they, it's kind of the way, you know, the, the way the hat was, it wasn't a beak, but I, I felt like that with that black thing on. Um, and I loved it because it, it made me feel like I was supposed to look uh, the other way around, whatever. So that was cool. And on the... Um, Dennis the Menace. Dennis the Menace. Uh, I got into that. But I, I have a scene where uh, I'm going through this back alley, you know, where the garbage trucks go in the middle of a pretty uh, high-end neighborhood. And... Um, there's a boy sitting on the other side of the fence on his private property who's he, he got an apple. And I come up, I lean over, and I take a big knife and I oh, stab man. the apple and I take it. That boy, for the rest of the run, could not look at me. <laughs> I, I'd be out of, out of makeup, out of costume, walking, and he'd be walking up with his mom he would completely shrink. Never got over it. He never got over it. And I don't care. <laughs> Can you tell me any stories of any jobs you had before you were famous? I moved, well, I did a lot of stuff, you know. I was a bouncer at a nightclub. I was, uh, you know, at the, at the, the night, yeah, big guys, right? Absolutely. So I was starting to do stand-up comedy, and people said, well, you're a big dude. So if you do the door, you keep the room, settle down, you know, you do all that stuff. And then when the big 
you know, stars are done with their work, you get to get on stage. Or if somebody doesn't show up, you get to do their stuff. So Richard Pryor was a great comedian, and he was doing uh, all these uh, movies of his performances, live on the Sunset Strip, that kind of stuff. So I was kind of the guy to walk up to eight dudes making a big commotion. You fellas are going to have to settle down, or I'm going to take you all out of here. You know, just pray, please don't hit me. Please, nobody do anything bad. So, uh, so I did that for a while. I moved Oriental rugs at this factory with like, like you know, nine by twelve gigantic rolled up Oriental rugs with a bunch of big dudes. You know, hike up the whole rug on your shoulder, and your camera rugs like all day. And if anything will convince you to use your brain, you know, and not your back, man, carrying around rugs all day, you're thinking, I gotta get a new gig, man. This is not, you know, this is no good. So, uh, so you know, I, I um, so the arts, man, the arts uh, saved my life, and uh, it's. I don't know, it's just been, as I said, it's been so fortunate, I can't even believe it. Look, I'm from Philadelphia, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go to New York. I'm probably going to get kicked in the teeth, you know, it probably won't work out, I don't know. But you're going up against the big guys, the big actors, the big everything, I'm going to just try it. I'm going to try it. And then I'm going to go home, and you know, whatever happens, I'm going to say, you know what, I gave it my best shot. And I have a couple exciting stories. And then I went home and, you know, and got a job or whatever. So I'm as surprised as anybody that I just kept getting jobs. You know? Not like, D -d 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 oh, he's the biggest superstar. No, but just a working actor. You know? A working performer. That stuff. I can't believe it. So I'm still doing it. I worked at a gas plant. I was a maintenance man out there. I was... I worked at a graveyard where my brother Owen's buried. I worked there when I was a kid raking leaves and uh, keeping the graves clean and all that. I um, worked at a steel mill. Um, I, of course, was a referee for about a year before I got into wrestling. And um, I used to have my own little silkscreen company where I used to make t-shirts and stuff like that. But I always, uh, you know, I worked hard. I think I tried to anyway. and. Uh, I think all those things served me well when I finally became a, a wrestler. I was I worked as a bartender when I was about 16, serving highballs at a big fancy hotel. Um, a lot of just simple jobs, but uh, like I say, they all sort of make the they make you who you are. You know, I'm real lucky. Uh, I I was a bartender at a, at an oldies but goodies album recording. Uh, I was a bartender. Uh, for Bette Midler and David Bowie at uh, a Universal Amphitheater in L.A. I got, I got to be the bartender in the VIP room. Uh, and I was a, a busboy at a 50s coffee shop uh, outside of Hollywood for a couple of years. But that's it. And I kind of said to myself, if you're going to be an actor, be an actor. Too many people stay in Hollywood, or they stay in Chicago, or they stay in New York, and they don't take jobs outside of town. Now, of course, you can make a living in Atlanta, you know, because Atlanta's booming. It's like a new Hollywood or Vancouver, Canada. But you've got to be able to, if you get a job in, I don't know, in Florida, or you get a job in Georgia, or you get a job in Minnesota as an actor or a musician or as a photographer or as a reporter, and a writer. You take it. You take that job. Because if you're writing in Minnesota, you're a writer. If you're acting in Florida, you're an actor. If you're sitting around waiting tables in New York and you're calling yourself an actor, you're not. You're a busboy. You're a waiter. And that guy that went down to, at, to Florida or that guy that went to Minnesota to write or to act, they can call themselves a writer or an actor because they're doing what they want to do. You're waiting tables. That's not acting. I shifted boxes in the warehouse. I worked in a market, uh, you know, getting off the crack of dawn. My fingers were freezing cold, putting the stall up. I, uh, I worked in restaurants, a barman. I was an entertainer. The hardest thing I've ever done is I was an entertainer at children's parties. That is humiliating, let me tell you. <laughs> Particularly if you're working for actors and people who are your age or younger and, and make a ton of money. Um, I, I, nothing is beneath my dignity. I think you know, work is work is dignified and just get out of your house and do something. When did you start creating a vision for yourself, like maybe outside of that? I mean, I, I used to work at Wendy's and the manager came up to me one day and she was like, Dante, you're going to be a manager here one day. I never went back. Right. I had another vision for myself. You know, I'm not sure 
at Wendy's, you know, you know I'm, I'm noble to have a job, but it's just, right. I knew that wasn't for me. I knew I had a bigger vision for myself. For you, like, when did you have a, you know that you had a bigger vision for yourself? Well, so I, I went to college to study law originally, and, uh, and I was doing it, and I thought I should do everything as a hobby. While you're at college, do it, take advantage of anything. Always, always say yes, regret the things you've done, not the things you have, and never say no. So I said yes to everything, and I tried to, you know, do anything I could. And one of the things I thought that students did, my cliche though, is they did a play. I thought they read philosophy books and they, you know, they drank French wine. So I don't know, I tried to do a bunch of shit. And um, so I did a play and I suddenly found I was in a room and I felt for the very first time in my life, like it didn't matter where I came from and I wasn't self-conscious about anything. I wasn't always thinking other people had the key. Other people, I'd been to that class where life was explained that I'd missed, you know? And uh, so I did play after play after play. I just followed my passion. And, um, and I, just for a second, I began to think, you know, there are some people that do this for a living. And I applied for drama schools, and I made what I thought was a tough decision, which is I wasn't going to do a sensible job, and I probably was going to be poor, but I was going to be happy and fulfilled. I never thought I would survive. I never thought about, ha you know, anything to do with finance. I thought, if I could do this all my life, if there was food in the fridge, I'd be happy. It so happens I've ended up making a good living, but mostly what I did is I followed my gut and I followed my passion. I followed the one thing I did where I felt like I was myself. My name is Dante Luna. Um, I like educating people, empowering people to reach their full potential. Um, but I'm, I'm really inspired by hearing uh, what you guys uh, did for regular job, what kind of regular jobs you guys had before you were famous. We don't have all day. This is going to be a long one. Listen, my resume of survival jobs is long. Waited tables, uh, slung drinks, delivered laundry. Um, I worked at farm camp when I was 13. That was my first job because I thought I was going to be a veterinarian actress. So I uh, helped birth cows and tag pigs and like took chickens home in inner city Detroit. And my parents were like, what the mm is this? Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of stuff. I did, um, does anyone remember the Village Voice from... Yeah. from yeah. Well, is it not around anymore? Is that so not they, around? Village well, they, they closed the print division, but in oh, my okay. day, okay, the print. before, okay. I was the best personal ad taker for the Village Voice. <laughs> so I had, I was so good that Geraldo Rivera actually interviewed me for 2020. <laughs> Shut um, up! And I was, I, literally, I would write these personal ads and people would call in and have me write their personal ads for them. How many for did, everything? How many did Frank call in for you? No, oh, I think, <laughs> what's it, 7,160? <laughs> uh, uh, seeking woman with big feet. <laughs> that was and, wow. and how do you say big feet in a, a nice way in a personal ad? So, a feet. size 12. <laughs> <laughs> She's the best. Yeah. I sold uh, lingerie for mature women. <laughs> Very lucrative. Angela Lansbury was your number she one. Was my top, she was my top, my top, my top. Don't out Angela. Come on. Don't out. Oh my God. It's calling names, name droppers. I miss, I miss those days. Like you miss education. I miss, I miss selling that stuff because I, I like to put a smile on people's faces. That was good. Because you got to get the right fabric, got to be the right fit. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. You, you measured them. You took the measurements too, didn't you? Naturally. <laughs> He's always got tape measure in his pocket. Now it makes sense. And I, st I do. I still carry the tape measure in case I bump into some customers from the old days. But <laughs> so if anybody's looking, yeah. anybody's looking. Yes, and I always and I still carry my fabrics, my laces. So if anybody's looking for something comfortable and form fitting. Ballroom C. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. Ballroom C. <laughs> Just, just skip the inseam part. Don't don't get your inseam. Just just don't do the inseam. Theo, what about you? Job. Everything. Uh, I've been working since I was nine years old. So I started Illegally. delivering newspapers. <laughs> I I, uh, I hustled a lot. I did I did I did whatever I had to do. I was always geared towards money. Uh, Define hustle. I don't want I don't want to get. <laughs> he doesn't want to get. I don't want to incriminate myself at any moment. But. Um, Nine years what, what was your job at nine? Uh, I delivered the Islander on Staten Island the newspaper. Yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, had the bag in front of my bike, my uh, Diamondback, my bike that I Diamondback. 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 Oh. I was like, oh, that was my bike. No pun. Um, and, uh, that's a nice bike. 
It was a nice bike, and uh, I had a Huffy he before He stole that. it. He stole that bike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I might have stole that bike. Might have uh, stole it. <laughs> I definitely stole the pegs. I might have stole something on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, everything, uh, literally everything. Uh, one, uh, I mean, weird stuff. I, I, I was, uh, had a dress, like, not dress fully as Sonic the Hedgehog, but kind of for Christmas in KB Toy and Hobby. I was, like, wearing, like, yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog gear, but not the actual thing, like, just the vest and stuff. I was hawking, like, Sonic the Hedgehog Sega games. Uh, you know, I, but you got to understand, I, I started as an extra in this business. I had to do three extra jobs to get a SAG card to, like, so then it was, like, one line on a TV show, four lines, and a guest star, then this. So I've been through, like, all that stuff until, like, Sons, you know, came. It was, like, I was the dude who was on doing every guest star. So I just kind of did everything to kind of get to wherever. And, like, you say survival jobs, which I love that term. You do whatever you had to do, and it was, like, whatever. When we got to L.A., we would, like... We did this thing where you seal envelopes, you know, to make money. You know, you put Why did I know about that as a yeah. job? They send you a bunch of stuff, you just seal, you put them in and seal them, thousands of envelopes, and you're making, like, no money. So, whatever you got to do. That's why education is important, guys. So you don't have to do this. Yeah, you don't have to struggle. If you know how to type, you might be able to sit in the office or something, but I didn't know how to type, you know? I was like, yeah. I, 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 those typing classes, I took them for granted. Yeah, not, not good. Look at these long fingers going to waste. <laughs> Um, so yeah, survival jobs quickly. I had a few. Um, I, I did. I worked with group home kids in LA for about a year. Um, that that was tough, but that was that. I learned a lot from that. Um, and I worked with um, a lot of restaurants. Uh, I did uh, labor ready, which was the bottom of the barrel. Um, you guys know what that is. You show up with your your ID and you work for a day for a minimum wage. And that was after I had a master's degree, so I still was you know couldn't get a job immediately. Um, and then my, one of our more embarrassing jobs as far as waiting tables, I worked at Fridays in, in grad school, right out of grad school, or in grad school, and you knew you had to do your flair, I think, is a flair thing. Yeah, well, yeah I, I was, uh, I, I had a cowboy hat on, because that's all I could find. My roommate had a, a big old white cowboy hat, and I could have, I, I was just, that's all, that's what was there, and I said, well, I, I had no money, so I, I wore it. So my whole thing became a cowboy, and cowboy hat, suspenders, and I had all this, you know, uh, flair all around me. It no was, shirt, no, no shirt, no shirt, no shirt. <laughs> Obviously, no shirt. Lots of baby oil, um, and then almond butter. Almond butter. <laughs> uh, I got recruited uh, from there. Um, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, man. You know. I remember my first job in order to raise money to buy an outfit, a wrestling outfit uh, or gear was, uh, and I don't think my parents ever found out about this, uh, right up the street of my house there was a gas station and this was in Tijuana, Mexico. And as a matter of fact, it, there's, uh, kids are very accustomed to roll up in cars with the, with the do-rag mm -hmm. and offer to clean the car so you can tip them. So I did that for a couple hours, trying to make some money. I worked in bars, I was a delivery guy, I did, uh, you know, paper round, but mostly it was bars and cafes and stuff like that, barista jobs. I worked as a cleaner at drama school and stuff like that, so I did all those jobs really. I, at the drama school I was at, I sort of cleaned the building as well, so that's, uh, that was one of the things I did. I collected the carts at Big Apple Supermarket in the parking lot, that was my first job. Then I then I heard uh, you know uh, minimum wage was a dollar twenty five. We're going back a while, so I heard I heard they were paying a dollar fifty for dishwashers at the uh, Jewish temple. So then I went and worked there for a while. But I you know I, I, I worked my whole life. I you know I I bartended. I, I did you know I waited tables. I, I worked in the restaurant business. I uh, I was a kitchen steward. I I did a lot of stuff like that. And then uh, my first acting job was in Bucks County Playhouse. In, uh, in Pennsylvania, and and while I was, uh, I had a I had a little part in 1776, and while I was there, I got a job uh, um, chauffeuring uh, businessmen from New Hope to Trenton and from Trenton to New York and stuff. So I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I'm an Italian kid. My father's a garbage man, and uh, and the work ethic was very important. Oh my God, I had every regular job in the world. Like I, I when I was younger, especially in high school, uh, I begged to get my first job when I was like 15 and my parents like, are you sure you want to do that? I'm like, yeah, I want to. So I, I've been a bus boy at a seafood restaurant. I was a waiter for a really long time. I worked at a video store. I worked for a small airline uh, in reservations. So I, they, I was the person that you'd have to talk to if you needed to change your reservation. So I got yelled at a lot. Although I also messed with people a lot. Uh, that was always fun. 
because I had all the power. I could change their flight or not change their flight, so I could just chill out. Uh, God, what other jobs I have? I was a the kind of marketing director at that small airline for a while. Everyone else told me what my vision was supposed to be because when you, your voice drops from a really high-pitched, almost uh, female-type voice to a very low voice overnight, almost to the voice I have now, like in seventh grade, everyone tells you, you got to get into radio. But, you know, there was no internet back then. I couldn't look up, like, how to get into radio on the internet. You just sort of had to figure these things out. But, um, and I was really young, of course, so I'm still 12, and everyone's telling me I need to do stuff. So I just kind of followed whatever, I kind of followed whatever path was in front of me. I went to school as an opera major, actually, originally, because that's where I got my scholarship at University of North Texas, but then changed my degree to radio, television, film, and it was before I graduated that I was offered the job to work on uh, Dragon Ball Z, and I, they, they paid me literally nothing. I think I got paid more as a waiter than I did when I first started working at Funimation, but um, it seemed like a fun thing to do, and it seemed like a good way to use my voice, and uh, it ended up being a pretty good decision. <laughs> The character Roger Rabbit is, you know, uh, part of my soul because, you know, uh, the line in the movie, only when it's funny, you know, it makes people laugh and I'm a stand-up comedian so I relate to that. It's why I do what I do because artists have touched my soul and that empowered me to reach out and try and do the same to others. I've always, you know, you know done stand-up or, when I was in high school I sold small appliances but I used to just sell odd numbers. But I, I, I could never get even. Yo, man, this guy caught me off guard. Like I, I, everybody else, I can compose myself. I can't even keep you a straight face. You compose yourself. I'm a composer. <laughs> I will take the needed line. I will take the needed stance, advance the place to make it dance. Enchanting, but not oblong. What? Oblong. And I got a Davida, Margarita. Well, Soda and I uh, lived together in New York City, and both the time we were just out of school and uh, scraping by to find jobs. Uh, I'd worked at a jazz record store uh, in the back, distribution, packing jazz records and sending them out when orders came in. Uh, you got me my first job working behind the pen counter of a stationery store on the <laughs> Upper West Side. Uh, and then I became a security guard at the Guggenheim Museum. Right, right. You were waiting tables, one -way tables. bartending at a place called the Hotel Galvez. Which was fun. So we could always go down and you'd shut down, but we could still drink out of the frozen margarita machine because the boss wouldn't know how much was gone. <laughs> right, right. So that was what I was allowed, tap beers and frozen yeah, yeah, margaritas. Yeah. And we'd close the door and they had a little stage on the side and we'd uh, go just for each other and kind of try to do late night stand up uh, for each other and work on some jokes. Yeah, and we were always showing up at each other's jobs, yeah, screwing yeah, around, stuff like yeah. that. But yeah, supporting each other, you know? Yeah, it was cool. We'd go to Burger King and we'd get uh, Whopper Night. It was a 99 cent Whopper night on Tuesdays nice. at this one Burger King, so we'd go and buy 25 Whoppers. And stack, stack our freezers with our Whoppers, yeah. living Mountain doing Whoppers for Those a year. Those were the days. Ah, good yeah. stuff, yeah, yeah. I started as a 12-year-old kid uh, rubbing the fat off of a butcher's block. Hey, Pitbull, can you keep it down there? I started rubbing the fat off of a butcher's block after he killed chickens and stuff, literally at the end of the day because the fat would accumulate and uh, bacteria and all that. So I was 12 years old and almost threw up every day. And I used to get the meat from the basement that was roach infested and bring it up. And then I delivered newspapers, sold door to door subscriptions to magazines and uh, all kinds of stuff. And he's talking while I'm talking, so I'm gonna find out where he lives. And done everything, including winding up being a sixth grade teacher, working for the Puerto Rican Interagency Council in New York, the assistant to the director, obviously the assistant to the editor of Vogue magazine, a checkout guy at a, at a restaurant, you name it, been there, done that. Everybody has visions all the time and everybody dreams and everybody has big hopes and all this kind of stuff. So I, I urge everybody never to give up on their dreams because anything is possible. I wasn't born in America. I couldn't even speak English. And the idea that all the doors are open if you're willing to put in the hard work, have the right thing at the right place and the right time and a lot of hard luck and, you know, and, and uh, you're, you're going to get shot down many times and you're going to hear the word no all the time. And so did Michael Jordan and so did Oprah and so did Henry Ford. All the winners only got to be winners because they failed all the time. So let me give you a piece of advice. I didn't come up with this. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm telling you. 
You see a guy like that here? Take a look at the big guy. Take a look at him. Who's going to stop him on a football field? Actually, everybody goes down. Everybody goes down. Whenever you see a champion, they've been knocked out. That's how they get to be champion. So your body kind of gets used to that. You know, you, you develop hard skin. You use your hands a lot, you'll get calluses. You're supposed to. You're supposed to make your heart pump. If you sit still and your heart doesn't pump, you will die very fast. So get that heart pumping. Get your mind working. Stop living on top of a mountain with Mother Nature. Nothing is going to happen to you there. You need to be in a big city and just soak up all the knowledge that you don't have that they do. Well, I, I go back to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and as a kid, my parents were very supportive and asked me to really do whatever I wanted to do. They, not, I mean, they were disciplined stuff. But I just kept trying things. I always wanted to act. I wanted to play basketball. I made it to college-level basketball. I was told no by the University of Tennessee Knoxville. I made it to the freshman team for one day, then they got and they cut me. So I went to Chattanooga and I got on that team. So just because one person tells you no, doesn't mean it's no from everybody. So get rid of the no people and find the yes people. And little by little, that's kind of been my, the way I've lived. And you try things and if it doesn't work, I keep moving something else. I just wanted to be an actor so bad that I was willing to risk everything and that's kind of what it takes. I, I had somebody tell me to say by the Bell is their comfort food. That they can relax and, show, and see it and it makes them feel good. But our show didn't didn't succeed right away. Morning Miss Bliss was canceled. Then they bought three or four of the characters from that show and took the Saved by the Bell. And then we only did 20 and we had a rap party. And then they decided let's do some more and then let's do some more. So it was a long, slow process. It wasn't an instant hit. But then it went to 87 countries around the world. So imagine if we gave up right away. My advice for younger people that are kind of ex don't know how to express themselves or, or get their voices heard is just you have to be you. You can't sacrifice yourself just to make other people happy and follow your dreams. There's the, we're all going to not always make the right choice. But God knows I've never made the right choice, but now I have made right choices. I have not made very good ones too. But in the end of all this, and I am a recovering addict and six years sober and it's awesome. And so yeah, I've made some mistakes but they've all come back is just following my dream and doing the right thing, doing the next right thing. It's just, we're gonna make mistakes, we get it. But it's just how do you recover from that and not keep making them over and over. And just be you, be true to yourself. I mean, it really is just comes down to that. And just, just have fun with life. Don't take it so seriously. And just if you wanna go right, go right. If you wanna go left, go left. So just that's my advice for whatever that's worth. <laughs> I grew up and we had uh, uh, baseball, football, you know, soccer. Get, get out, get out of the house, go play, and we'll see you when you get home. You know, uh, that was the that was what I grew up with. We didn't have video games. We didn't even have TV. I back there. We just had a stone we looked at for crying out loud. You know, and you know, and uh, but you know, we got along okay. I, but I've been so lucky because I I've got to live into the technology all the way to my iPhone six. <laughs> yes, you know, and enjoy all that. All those uh, the the whole journey's been totally fun for me. The, the best day was when I crashed the audition to do the voice of Mario, and I had no idea who Mario was or what video games were except wacka 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 wacka, you know. And I and I'm just uh, I walked in the door. I said, you know, can I read for this? He goes, All right, you're an Italian plumber from Brooklyn, so make up a voice. You're a video game character. Make up a video game. Start talking, and when you run out of things to say, that's your audition. And I'm like, Italian plumber from Brooklyn, right? Hey, get out of my face! Don't bother me. I thought, No, I'm not gonna do that. I'll do something nice. And I, what came to me was Grammy from Tammy the Shoe that I had played in a in a theater piece a few years before. A nice Italian guy. I said, Hello, I'm a Mario. Let's make a pizza pie together. You will get sausage. I go get the spaghetti meatballs. You put it in the pizza, and then we bake the pizza, and I chase with the pizza. If I catch you the pizza, you gotta make it the pizza and eat the pizza and chase me with the pizza. And I just started talking and I was having so much fun with this game, voice, that I, I didn't stop until I heard, stop talking, cut, 30 minutes later. There's no more videotape. Thank you. We'll be in touch. And you know, that was 25 years ago of absolute joy and, and fun and laughter. I, I love my life so much. I get to come to Comic-Con and 
and meet fans. I get to work with great people at Nintendo. I get to see the world. It's, it's, it's the greatest and it's always what I wish for everybody is that you follow your heart, you pursue your passions, you develop your dream because life is so short and you know, go out there and have as much fun as you can. Bring happiness to people, bring smiles to people, bring yourself to people. That's the greatest gift you can give. I want to get your advice to uh, your advice to young creatives who, uh, who maybe haven't heard their voice yet uh, as, a, as an artist or as a creative person. That only your tattoo, this is no excuses, it's spelled wrong. No excuse, no excuses. So is that yeah, two no, words? Yeah, it's spelled wrong. There's two S's. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Read as much as you can. That's what distinguishes, um, you know, like the golden age of Hollywood, the, the, what's going on now. Because back in the day, people grew up reading. And, uh, you know, stay away from the electronics as much as you can. But just read. Read everything you can. My advice to young actors is that they have to discover their own inner voice and their own sense of truth. It's all about truth and honesty. Um, audiences can tell in a second if you're lying. And even when you're creating another character that's other than yourself, you have to find the truth of that character, the essence of that character. It's really about, it's, it's the accumulation of your whole life. It's everything you've been through. It's all your experiences. When I was at Juilliard, they used to tell us to go to the museums, to look at great works of art, to go to the theater, to go to opera, to go to ballet. Because the more you're exposed to other great art, the more sensitive you, became, you become to, to, to all aspects of life. And you bring all that to your acting. So acting is really about finding the truth of the character. And you can't really do that if you haven't found your own truth. My experience in, in terms of my career has been that you always have to be willing for, to, for surprises. I mean, I studied at Juilliard to be a, a classical stage actor and then discovered that the classical stage, you couldn't live on it. You couldn't support yourself on it. And it sort of evaporated. There isn't much of one anymore. So I had to get into TV. And then from TV, I was led into voice acting and animation. You, you have to go where life takes you. John Lennon has a great line in one of his songs, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And I think you really have to be open to that. You have to be open to what life's going to throw at you and be ready to roll with it. I'm going to take my hat off for you because oh, out, of, out of respect, I'm going to take my hat off for you. It's funny, like SpongeBob isn't something you really have to prepare for because just doing the character prepares you. You know, like like it's it's my you know my my favorite part of the job is getting able is being able to uh, portray this kind of positive, happy character that makes kids laugh and hopefully uh, adults and 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 other people laugh and you know. You just step right into it, and it kind of draws you into kind of this positive mindset for four hours every Wednesday, and uh, it kind of it kind of helps get me through the rest of the week, you know, because 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 the world can be a hard place. I love coming to these events with a million questions. It's the best kind of school you can get, you know, um, other than like being out on the field doing industry experience, being able to being a, a building with a bunch of people who've had industry experience um, and ask them questions. It's uh, always been extremely valuable to me, I, and I think I'll always do it. I come to these kinds of conventions to to learn and to, to build and connect um, and to create conversations that last for forever. When it comes to your legacy, what do you what do you feel is um, some of your best work? Well, this leg I see, but this leg I don't. If you go for armature, then my arm won't do. Arms in the man, well, I can say either. My legacy. I want to leave uh, a body of work that will inspire people to become all that they can and uh, reach higher and, you know, touch humanity with love. I know it sounds a bit in love and peace and all, but it's a real sentiment, isn't it?